welcome. I apologize for the slow movement to the podium, but I sustained a uh, injury to my hamstring uh, that uh, makes me move a little slower than usual. So be patient with me tonight. Um, I want to take a moment to thank you for spending uh, what is really a very precious commodity, and that's your free time, uh, spending some time with us tonight to talk about uh, uh, this issue, cancer. Uh, Robbie talked in her introductory comments about the fact that we're demystifying cancer. I don't want to leave anyone with the impression that we've solved the cancer problem. But what I do want to try to impart tonight is that uh, we've taken what is a complex and, and sort of uh, disease that has struck fear and terror into the hearts of anybody who's heard that word in terms of a diagnosis and really begun to deconstruct it and make a lot more sense of how we treat it so that we develop more and more effective and less toxic therapies in our approach. Um, we have a, uh, a stellar panel that will have a panel discussion after I uh, make uh, uh, my introductory uh, uh, comments and, and the presentation. And Dr. John Glaspie, who's the first person I'll introduce, will also uh, talk about um, what he's been involved with uh, as a full partner with me in uh, the Division of Hematology Oncology at UCLA and building a network, a clinical research network that extends to the entire Southern California community and now is extending uh, around the country uh, in terms of taking clinical research from the Westwood campus and putting it in the community so that patients who are challenged with this disease have access to cutting edge therapy without having to come to a university campus. And I think that's a dream that both John and I talked about when we first took over control of the Division of Hematology Oncology at UCLA, and I think it's in large part come to fruition uh, due to other panelists who are sitting up there. Um, Dr. Carlos Molinas, going to the farthest area, is a uh, uh, really an outstanding uh, radiologist whose expertise in breast imaging uh, is something that's critically important in the identification an early diagnosis of, of breast cancer lesions. Uh, he uh, is uh, the head mammographer for the uh, Rolling Oaks uh, radiology group uh, and uh, is someone that we work very closely with in the establishment of the UCLA program out in uh, Westlake at Thousand Oaks uh, and look forward to continuing to work with him uh, in, in our endeavors to move things forward. Uh, next to Carlos is Dr. Melissa Cohen. Uh, Dr. Cohen uh, is a graduate of George Washington University in, uh, in D.C., a town which is uh, living in infamy most recently, but uh, we don't hold that against her. Uh, Melissa uh, came out and trained with us in, in hematology oncology, uh, but also received training in geriatrics. So she has uh, uh, expertise in both areas and uh, is leading our community program and our uh, our UCLA practice in Porter Ranch, a newly opened uh, practice that's serving that side of the valley. Uh, next to Melissa is Dr. Ashuri. Do I see him there? Okay. Sorry? Okay. I'm at a bad angle here. Uh, Dr. Ashuri uh, came to us from USC. We, we also don't hold that against him. Um, and he really leads our program uh, in Westlake Thousand Oaks. Uh, we were uh, really uh, very lucky to get Shay as well as Melissa uh, out of training. He was the chief fellow uh, in hematology oncology at USC. Um, they wanted him to stay and we stole him away and uh, so much the better for us. Uh, he has brought our clinical research programs to the community, leads the practice in doing that and uh, really has, uh, has built an outstanding program uh, for UCLA. Uh, in that serves the Conejo Valley. Next to Dr. Ashuri is Dr. Paul Miller. Now, Paul is a, an old friend who we have uh, worked with from the very beginning uh, in terms of building some of our research programs that uh, brought clinical research uh, programs out to the Conejo Valley. And that's because Paul himself has had expertise in this area. Uh, he led one of the U.S. cooperative group uh, efforts at Los Robles Hospital. Uh, he's a radiation oncologist uh, and has incredible expertise in this area, both in terms of the clinical uh, use of radiation therapy, but also of how that integrates into research 
and some of the new uh, modalities that are used in, in that type of therapy to treat patients and has been extraordinarily collaborative with us in terms of thinking about how to bring more and better programs to, uh, to patients uh, in, this, in this region. Uh, next to Paul is uh, Jody Tompkins. Jody, some may be known to some of you, she is the Vice President for uh, Programs for the uh, um, Outreach Community Support Center for the Valley, for, uh, for Ventura, and for up as far as Santa Barbara, and is uh, the Vice President for uh, Programs in that group, and has brought really outstanding support, which is critically important to any patient or family who is uh, undergoing uh, cancer treatment, cancer follow-up, um, and has done this uh, and provided these services to the community for more than 20 years. She's a licensed family therapist, I may have said that already, but in, a, in addition to that, uh, they have programs that have served more than 3,000 patients, uh, teens, children, and adults uh, in this region uh, free of charge. So. It's an important uh, uh, asset that we all depend on. And then uh, John Glasby has been uh, my partner at UCLA in terms of building the programs we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, he is a nationally, internationally known expert in the uh, field of oncology, has developed considerable expertise in developing uh, some of the supportive care for uh, patients who were being treated and were experiencing some of the less favorable side effects of what we do in treatment and making that much different than it was previously in terms of using growth factors, using antiemetics, things that would make uh, the therapeutic approaches to the disease much more tolerable. Uh, but more important than that, John has been one of the uh, real practitioners of the, not just only the science of medicine, which he does as well as anybody, but the art of medicine. And I've been lucky to have him as a partner from the beginning. So. Now we're going to demystify cancer, or at least uh, uh, as much as I shock Robbie to say we're going to try to demystify cancer. Um, can we have the slides? There we go. So to start off, and Robbie's going to keep me on a short timeline, so let me put my timer on. Uh, to start off, uh, um, we're going to talk about the molecular diversity of this disease. and. Um, don't let that be any kind of intimidating term, molecular. Um, it just means that we've come to an appreciation that rather than classifying this disease by where it occurs in the body, lung cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, et cetera, et cetera, we're now beginning to understand that we're classifying it based on the pathways that have been broken in the cell that converts a normal cell, irrespective of where it is, into a malignant cell. And sure enough, as you might think, there are many pathways that are common to several malignancies and uh, make them amenable to therapies that would cut across this old way of classifying based on where the tumor arises and develop therapeutics based on what's broken. Uh, and so I'm gonna talk to you about the biologic and therapeutic implications of that. Now, um, several years ago, uh, a guy by the name of Cliff Leaf, who's a very good writer, uh, writes for many of the major magazines, uh, wrote this cover story for Fortune magazine saying why we're losing the war on cancer and then a much smaller print and how to win it. Um, now, interesting thing about Cliff is he himself um, is a cancer survivor. He, and talks about this openly, as a young man he developed Hodgkin's disease and enrolled early on in one of the clinical trials at the National Cancer Institute at the time when these trials were really only accessible at uh, major uh, academic centers or universities or in uh, the cancer, comprehensive cancer center program. He enrolled in one of these trials and did extremely well, had a disease that was previously incurable, stage three Hodgkin's disease, and uh, became cured to the point that he's still able to write and lecture us on how to do this better. And I think there are several things in this article that Cliff writes that, that I agree with. There are some things that I disagree with, but it's a very thought-provoking article that talks about some of the things we're gonna talk about tonight in terms of um, thinking about and demystifying this disease. Now, at the end of the day, what cancer is, is a, uh, 
a dysregulation of something that's very tightly regulated. I think most of you know that. What's tightly regulated is cell division. And when you want to think about amazing processes that go on, and, and I, I, I think we uh, will take uh, second seat to no one, including our colleagues at NASA who explore the universe, when we think about exploring the cell. Because what happens uh, in, uh, in biology, uh, in the mammalian development, is you go from, and this is for humans, you go from a single cell to in a newborn between one and five trillion cells, all organized in the right place in the body, doing the right function, uh, and carrying out all the right activities. And that happens with a complete blueprint of each one of you being copied every time one of your cells divides. Hence the dolly the sheep experiment where you could take, forgetting for a moment about the social imp or moral implications of this thing, scientifically, you could take a skin cell from a sheep and in that s single skin cell is the entire blueprint for that same sheep and in fact, scientists have been able to do that and clone animals. Um, that means that if you're able to <coughs> read that blueprint, you can go uh, through that biologic process from a single cell to an organism in a period of time. Now, uh, so you don't think that this all stops at birth. Uh, all of you have an enormous amount of cell growth going on in you every single day um, in multiple organs in your body, and you may not appreciate uh, exactly how much cell, uh, cell growth is going on. In the adult, um, there are some 50 to 100 trillion cells um, some tissues are, are turning over more rapidly, others less rapidly. Things like the central nervous system and the brain have cells that don't turn over as often, although they do uh, turn over to some degree. The heart. Uh, and then there are other tissues like the bone marrow, the skin, the entire lining of the gastrointestinal tract, uh, the cells in our lymphoid tissue that uh, um, um, uh, defend us. And these things have an amazing amount of proliferation that goes on every day. For the bone marrow, for example, <clears throat> you may not realize that, it, but in, an, in the period of about a 12 to 24 hour process, you have made, just for white cells alone, cells that defend you from the acute bacterial infections that sometimes we're challenged with, you will have made some 17 billion new cells in the course of a day. They have a very defined lifespan, they, they then die and there's a new group that's made out of your bone marrow. Should you receive an infection uh, or should you be exposed to an infection and it takes hold, a signal will go out from the lymphocytes to the bone marrow to produce more of these white cells, neutrophils, and you'll go from a production of 17 billion up to a production of between 40 and 50 billion in the course of a day, an enormous amount of growth. Those signals uh, that the lymphocytes put out are controlled by genes that the lymphocytes have that signal to the white cells that they need to proliferate. Um, and that is one of the things that Dr. Glassby worked on for many years that is now a drug that we use, something called GCSF, made by a company just up the road, uh, Amgen, uh, which is made uh, as a therapeutic that really makes a huge difference in cancer patients' lives. Uh, when they're being treated with the uh, therapeutics that we currently uh, standardly use. Um, <clears throat> when the infection is cleared, the signal goes back to the bone marrow that we have enough cells and you go back down to the usual old 17 billion per day. So think about that amount of turnover. And then think about all the tissue in the body. The biggest organ in the body, of course, is the skin. That's turning over uh, uh, on a every few day basis uh, for your, the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, for many of us, although not all of us, myself and Dr. Ashuri among those less fortunate, hair cells turn over uh, <laughs> frequently. Um, so y you can see what I'm talking about. There's all this proliferation, there's all the cell division um, that's going on in us all the time. Now, the scary statistic and what the public really gets concerned about, and, and I get frequently asked, excuse my language, what the hell have you guys been doing? We're not making any progress when we hear a statistic like, one in two men and one in three women will develop cancer sometime during the course of their life. Now that is indeed a frightening statistic and it's a true statistic. Many of those cancers will be relatively easy to deal with, squamous cell carcinoma, the skin, et cetera, but others can be uh, quite challenging. 
But in part, the reason this is occurring is because of the success of our colleagues. It wasn't so long ago, uh, in the 1800s, for example, that women uh, using that uh, part of our important species as, as, as a benchmark lived in their fourth and fifth decade, many of them dying in childbirth or in the post, uh, postpartum period uh, due to infections, due to complications of uh, pregnancy and delivery. Um, and enter the field of obstetrics, which made that a much better, uh, a much better discipline, uh, and women lived through childbirth. And then in the early 1900s, with the discovery of what was the old antibiotics, sulfa drugs, uh, something that previously was almost a death sentence, almost something that was as feared as, as cancer is today, pneumonia. If you develop pneumonia, uh, you almost always succumb to that disease until the antibiotic era. So people went from their living to their fourth and fifth decade to living into their sixth decade and seventh decade. And then our colleagues in cardiology learned about uh, the risk factors that mitigate, uh, when controlled, mitigate against cardiovascular disease. So cholesterol, controlling blood pressure, uh, uh, having a bit more of an active lifestyle, watching dietary intake of things that aren't necessarily good for you, has taken cardiovascular disease down as the number one killer, and people were living into their seventh and eighth decade. Uh, most recently, with the control of metabolic diseases and turning things like diabetes from uh, a, a disease with a lot of morbidity and mortality to disease that's a chronic illness that we can control uh, with good internal medicine and good management, um, now people are living into their ninth and women into their tenth decade. So that's the good news. The problem is this problem of cell division. Every time a cell divides, it's got to divide and copy that blueprint with complete fidelity. And mistakes can't get made. And if mistakes are made, if they're not in critical genes, there's no harm, no foul. But if they occur in critical genes, and that is genes that regulate all this growth I'm telling you about, you can be off to the races with the process we know as cancer. So on the one hand, we're, we're reaping the benefits of the success of our colleagues in other disciplines of medicine, but that's what's making the incidence of cancer go higher. So even if you live a perfect life um, and eat all the right things, do all the right exercises, um, you still are at risk by virtue of the fact that when the blueprint is copied by the Xerox machinery in the cell. If a mistake's made in the wrong area, you have a problem. Now, the cell takes care of this, and we'll talk about it a bit when we talk about this division, by things that are found in the cell called spell checkers, uh, just like the spell checker in your word processor. So when the DNA is copied, if, if there are mistakes that are made, there are a series of spell checkers that can go in and, and identify the mistakes, cut them out, and repair them. And it's a process called DNA repair. And this occurs before the cells are allowed to divide to go from a parent cell into two uh, offspring or daughter cells, as we call it. Uh, science is very uh, gender-oriented and slanted. Um, but at any rate, uh, this, this process is an important process. It works extremely well uh, up to about age 35. So uh, looking at me, you can tell that I'm long off warranty. But that doesn't mean that the spell checker stops working. They just work less effectively. So the longer you live, the more you're at risk for having a mistake made in one of these critical genes.